Hello, today we're going to look at the relation between creation and Israel. So, what we're looking at first is that the name of the Lord, with capital letters, is connected to Israel in the Bible. For this you'll have to do some personal study, I'm not going to go into that at the moment. The Bible uses the generic name God in the first chapter, where God creates the heavens and the earth as a way to introduce from a basic understanding. As soon as the Bible is done giving the creation week, it connects God's name with Lord. In Genesis 2 verse 4, it says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Genesis 2 verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. The word Lord is not introduced without the word God. It's the same person. The God of Israel is the God that created this whole world. It goes on to name all the rivers in the garden. And even though the rivers don't exist anymore, you will see that those rivers um, or some rivers in the Middle East have been named similar names. The Bible quickly introduces a setting near the Middle East. This is not a Roman account of a creation and this is not a Chinese account of a creation. It's not an Indian account of creation. It's a Jewish account of a creation. Let's see what Jonah says about the topic. Jonah 1 verse 9 and he said unto them I am an Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land which God does the Hebrew serve the Hebrew serves the God that made the dry land made the sea the nation of Israel is connected to the six-day creation story 2 Chronicles 2 verse 12 Hiram said moreover, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel that made heaven and earth, who hath given to David the king a wise son, endued with prudence and understanding, that might build an house for the Lord and an house for his kingdom. This king wasn't even indigenous to Israel. He was foreign. And even he realized that he needed to refer to the God of Israel as the God who made heaven and earth. Secondly, I would like us to go to Zechariah. And this is a fascinating verse. In fact, I should read this chapter a few times later in my personal study, considering just how beautiful this verse is. Zechariah 12 and verse 1. Zechariah 12 and verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him altogether the words israel heaven and earth are found together in one verse 16 times in the bible let's look at psalms 148 Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all ye stars of light, praise him ye heavens of heaven and the waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established them for ever and ever and he hath made a decree which shall not pass praise the lord from the earth ye dragons and all deeps 
fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn of His people, the praise of all His saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto Him. Praise ye the Lord. The nation of Israel is connected with the creation. The first part really makes you think back on Genesis 1. Look at verse 10. It talks about the beasts and the cattle and the creeping things and the flying fowl. Notice that the things mentioned before the beasts, the cattle and the creeping things, they were created before the beast and the cattle and the creeping things. And the things after verse 10, they were created after the beast, the cattle, and the creeping things. The psalm is slightly chronological, referring back to the creation. And it ends with exalting Israel, because Israel is God's people, and Israel is connected with the creation week story. See what David did when he started preparing for the temple. They started preparing with the temple, and many people were willing to give. This made David happy because he knows this is also something that God has on his heart. First Chronicles 29 and from verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our fathers forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. So, why is it God's? Because God made it. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. Come of thee. And thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee so why was there a temple because god created this world and david decided because god created this world it's only fair that we should serve him by building a temple isaiah 29 verse 16 surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay for shall the work say of him that made it he made me not or shall the thing Framed, say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth, that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth, and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness. I will direct his days. He shall build my city, and he shall 
Let go my gap, uh, captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt, the merchandise of Ethiopia and the Sabaeans, men of stature shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee, in chains they shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God, verily. Thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. God is saying that Jesus is connected to the creation. He's saying, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness. From verse 17, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. He shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Where does Jacob feature in the Bible? In Genesis. Why would God call the Jews Jacob? Because that reminds them of Genesis. The name Israel also reminds them of Genesis. Genesis means the beginning. In fact, when people refer to the beginning in the New Testament that actually might be referring to the book that means in the beginning Jeremiah chapter 32 our Lord God behold thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensed the iniquity of the fathers unto the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and hast made thee a name as at this day, and hast brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs, and with wonders, and with a strong hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with great terror, and hast given them this land, which thou didst swear unto their fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. See, this whole paragraph started with Jeremiah saying in verse 17, Ah, Lord, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. Israel is connected to the six-day creation. God made it that way, so that naturally a person that supports the one will support the other. Then, of course, there's the event where Ezekiel was threatened by the king of Assyria. To Second Kings chapter 19 and verse 10. It's also, of course, in Isaiah. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Now, do they know exactly who this God is? Apparently not. But remember that he doesn't give a real good description of who this God is. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeth, and the children of Eden which were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath? And the king of Arpath, 
and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and Eva. But Ezekiah knows who his God is. He understands who God is. Let's see what Ezekiah prays to God. We are turning to Isaiah chapter 37 from verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. This is the one way you can know that God alone is God, because he truly made everything. And this is the one way you can know that Israel truly belongs inside that land. It's because their God truly made the heavens and the earth. That's why the Jewish Old Testament contains in the first book the account of how God made the heaven and the earth. The Jewish account of how God made the heaven and the earth. And what do Israelites do unto this day? They keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath refers back to Genesis, where God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. The whole nation is structured according to the reality that God made the world. When Jews defend their position, they flip open the first page of the Bible. Let's go to when David brought back the ark into Jerusalem. Let's see what he said. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, whose covenant? God's covenant with Israel. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abram, and of his oath to Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob of a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when ye were but few, even the few and strangers in it. And when they went from nation to nation, and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Sing unto the Lord, all the earth, show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. His marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. But, but, the Lord made the heavens. There's no other God that can truly, rightfully say that their nation belongs in the land of Ghana, the land of Israel. What is God's secret? He is the one that made the heavens. Let's go to Psalms 136. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. For his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him alone who doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for, in, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. The nation of Israel flows directly out of the reality that God made the heavens and earth. In six days and on the seventh day he rested. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. 
but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Keep that in mind. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out. And that's what it says. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out. Thence, through a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Reading the passages in Deuteronomy and Exodus about the Sabbath, we realize God is giving two reasons for the Sabbath. That is, to remind them of the creation week, and secondly, to remind them of how God saved them out of Egypt. Let's go to Ezekiel and chapter 20 and learn more about this. Uh, you can read the whole chapter. It's worthwhile reading. It tells you many things about the Sabbath. So we're going to read from verse 5. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. So here Ezekiel is speaking to the elders. In the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. You can go and check Exodus 3 verse 16 about that. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then said I unto them, Cast you away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idol, idols of Egypt. And then it goes on saying how angry God was about that, and continues about how God decided, no, he's not going to be wrathful against Israel, but that he was going to wrought that his name should not be defiled amongst the heathens. Because if he was going to be doing the thing of destroying Israel, then his name would be defiled among the heathen. So what did God do? God saved Israel and he gave them blessings and he gave them a sign so that they could know this is the God who saved us. Let's read from verse 10. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments which if a man do he shall even live in them. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. The whole reason why God gave them the Sabbath 
<clears throat> is so that it can be a sign between them and God. The Sabbath is not for Christians today. You can see it says Sabbaths. There are more than one Sabbath. The other Sabbaths that the Israelites kept usually are about the way God saved them out of Egypt. Um, the one they kept every seventh day mostly refers back to the creation week and the concept of completion. But think about the concept of completion. The feast of unleavened bread was also for seven days. Exodus 21 verse 2 says, If thou buy an Hebrew servant six years, he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out for nothing. Exodus chapter 22 verse 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of the ripe fruits and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy son shalt thou give unto me. Likewise shalt thou do with thine oxen and with thy sheep. Seven days it shall be with his dam. On the eighth day thou shalt give it me. Also, exit. On the eighth day thou shalt give it me. Exodus chapter 23, verse 9. Also thou shalt not oppress the stranger, for ye know the heart of the stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest, and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the field, shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy oliveyard. Six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the Sabbath day thou shalt rest, that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid, and the stranger may be refreshed. And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Exodus chapter 24 verse 1. We're going through the sevens in the law to realize that God uses the number seven in the law in many ways. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 14. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Leviticus chapter 25 Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of, of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So the, uh, after the year of seven times seven, they have the year of jubilee. And they call those every seventh year a Sabbath. Okay. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shalt the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowels, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. The reason why I'm reading 
to you about the menorah, the candlestick, is because it relates to the creation week. The creation week is also like a menorah. The first three days and the last three days of the creation week, um, I mean the last three of the grating days, are connected. On the first day you have light being created, on the fourth day you have stars and lights. On the second day you have the firmament and the sea. On the fifth day you have the birds and the fish. Um, the birds are in the firmament and the fish are in the sea. And then on the third day you have the plants of the ground being created and on the sixth day you have the animals and people um, who survive from the plants who also live on the ground. So um, the creation week forms a menorah and if you look at a menorah there's also three crosses in the middle of the menorah and it's also like three men with their arms showing upward. So I always think of it uh, this way when the Jews saw the three crosses on the hill of Calvary what they were supposed to do is look up because God is trying to tell them something <laughs> on the Mount of Calvary those three crosses mean something Exodus chapter 29 and the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them and that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place exodus 29 verse 35 and thus shalt thou do unto aaron and his sons according to all things which i have commanded thee seven days shalt thou consecrate them exodus 29 verse 37 seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it and it shall be an altar most holy whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy leviticus 4 verse 6 and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the lord before the vial of the sanctuary <clears throat> that all nation in its law is organized around sevens and seven is the number of completion so let's ask a question if seven is the number of completion and there was more time before the first day of creation then those seven days weren't the seven days that contained the full completion of creation. Because on day one, you still have content that has been existing for a time frame like matter and space and the laws of science those things have been existing for quite some time when you get to day one of creation that is if you believe in Drapful Wapar I would like us to after considering that go to Malachi and chapter 2 Malachi and chapter 2 talks about God addressing the priests but it also talks about God addressing um, the people from Judah I'm going to read the last passage about divorce or the putting away see Malachi is the most Jewish book 
or one of the most Jewish books you'll find in the Bible. Compare it with the Pauline epistles and you'll have some um, interesting comparisons because it's different. It's different from the way we work today. In Malachi there are sacrifices and things. So God, God's addressing Jews in Malachi. And in chapter 2, he addresses marriage as something very, very important to him. And something he wants his people to keep holy. Okay, so you can read from verse 11 about how God talks about marriage. We are ever are going to read from verse 14. And it says, Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take ye heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. This is a passage that takes a lot of study to understand. But it is speaking about the fact that when you are married, you should stay married to your wife. Sometimes there are situations where divorce is needed. But of course, that doesn't mean there is no responsibility towards your wife. You made vows. You came before God and you got married. It means something. Look at the middle verse. It says that he might seek a godly seed. Now a seed has to do with the descendants and the generation. Look at verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. This is God being upset. And why is he upset? Because of sin. Who commits sin? Mankind commits sin. Look at the position of that word seed. One, two, three. Three, four, five, six. Mankind was created on the sixth day. Now let's go to verse 15. Where God says, And did he not make one? When did he make them one? When did Adam and Eve got married? They got married on the sixth day. Let's see where the word one is placed. One, two, three, four, five, six. They were made one on the sixth day. Man was created on the sixth day. Man was created on the sixth day and man causes divorce. It's not God that causes divorce. Look at verse 16. It says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. One of the most well-known verses about divorce. See, this verse has 36 words. That's 6 times 6. So this verse has 3 6s in it. 666 is the number of a man. What did Jesus say? Who causes divorce? Let's go to Matthew and chapter 19 and verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives but from the beginning it was not so and I say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery so Jesus makes it clear the reason why divorce happens today is because of man. It's, the, it's because of the hardness of our hearts. And another thing you'll notice is that this is the whole passage that Jesus speaks about divorce in that chapter, Matthew chapter 19. Um, you can go and read the context. This is what Jesus is saying. And... These two verses altogether contain 60 words. That's 6 times 10. Marriage is the way God describes his relationship between him and Israel. Marriage is also the way Jesus describes the relationship between him and his church. 
there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And of course this plays a role in the millennium. The sixth day is the sixth day for a reason. If you don't believe Genesis at all, if you throw that away, then you lose a document that supports Israel. Yes, the rest of the Bible works perfectly, but think of the two things someone might claim without Genesis. They might claim that the place was made for them, the land Canaan, Israel, Jerusalem, or they might claim that God didn't make it and that the world appeared by chance. Now, of course, you can refute that completely by flipping open the first page of your Bible. Now nobody has an argument anymore. That land belongs to Israel. Now let's take it further. I'm going to show you something that amazed me. We're going to Jeremiah and chapter 31 verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea, when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If, okay, why is God talking about these things? He made them. If those ordinances, this is verse 36, depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. I would say this is significant. Jeremiah chapter 33 And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, this is from verse 19, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea be measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant, and the Levites, that minister unto me. It's wonderful, incredible, great, wondrous. The God who made all this, He established Israel in that country. He established Israel there for His glory. And a wonderful way to glorify God is to realize this, and say Amen. The reality that the same place where you find God making a covenant with Abraham is the same place where you see God making a covenant with the sun and the moon or an understanding with the sun and the moon saying to them they will rule over the day and rule over the night. It's Genesis, the beginning. In Genesis, the beginning, God has an understanding with the sun and the moon. You rule over the day, you rule over the night. And he has an understanding with Abraham in Genesis, saying, your descendants will live in Israel. That's the beginning. That's where they go to find it. And when does that stop? In Revelations. The day and the night cease, and the millennium that has been promised to Israel also is fully completed in that time frame. And so, if Drabful Wapar is really true, then that cor correlation is not so significant anymore. That would be really sad. And I hope people will think about this and 
consider this as something to keep in mind. I hope this message blessed you and I hope to see you in the next video. God bless. Goodbye.